church said amen. 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 You may be seated. God bless you. Welcome to Sunday morning adult class today. We thank God for his blessings. We're turning to Hebrews chapter 2 and we will read verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Paul writing to the Jewish people and we are uh, picking up on our lesson this morning on so great salvation. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, Paul said, to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, listen to this question this morning, how shall we escape? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. How shall we escape? Now, last week we started this uh, lesson and we talked about how salvation uh, encompasses and embodies many different facets and terms and elements. And they're all explained in the scripture. And all of us, I think, would agree here today that we need salvation. I mean, it's not in the way of a man to order his own steps. And the scripture says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We went through the different definitions of salvation in Hebrew and Greek and English. We won't do that again. You can access last week's lesson and watch it on uh, the church website. You can listen to the audio. YouTube, you can see the video. By personal Facebook page, you can see the video with the audio. Either one of those. But uh, without getting into all that, let me just pick up where we left off. Last week, we went through the five doctrines of salvation. So think about salvation as the overarching concept and principle. And then underneath that are five different subcategories. There's the doctrine of regeneration that we'll talk about in just a moment. The doctrine of reconciliation. The doctrine of redemption. The doctrine of adoption. And I'm so glad he's adopted us into the family. And then the doctrine of ransom. Amen. That he loosened us with a redemptive price. And so just to summarize those five things, let me just say, say it this way. And then if you have your Bibles, we're going to open and look at some scripture here. Salvation includes a lot of different analogies and truths where salvation from sin is involved. Consider the fact that due to sin, we had to be remade, or as the scripture calls it, born again. You remember John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Nicodemus came to Jesus and said, Master, we know thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles thou doest except God be with him. Jesus stopped him in verse 3 and said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Nicodemus said, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, verse 5, Except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Verse 6, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Verse 8, thou hearest the sound thereof. You cannot tell from whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. So Jesus is teaching about regeneration here. He's talking about being born again. Nicodemus thought natural birth. How can an old man get back into his mother's womb and come back out? What if your mother's dead? I mean, that's impossible. That's where Nicodemus' mind went because this idea of reborn, rebirth, had never been broached before. So Jesus said, no, no, no. You're thinking natural. Let me take you to the spiritual. Amen. Reborn, rebirth is water and spirit. Everybody say water and spirit. The Bible calls this regeneration. Sin had separated us from God, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 through 2. But Christ made us nigh by his blood. Let's go to Isaiah 59 and 1. Again, I'm just giving you a few verses here to lay the groundwork. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, the prophet said, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated 
between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Do you know there is Bible for the idea that if you openly have sin in your life and you knowingly have sin that you won't repent of, that God will not hear your prayer? You say, oh, I thought he hears all of our prayers. If you are living in open, unrepentant sin, he will hear your prayer of repentance, but he will ignore your petitions. Because the Bible says your iniquities have separated between you and God. And it even says he won't hear. So I don't want to live in such a way that when I pray, God says, I can't even listen to you right now because you're so far from me and you're living in open, unrepented rebellion sin. I'm not going to hear your prayer unless it's a prayer of repentance. I want to live in such a way that I can drop to my knees at any time and touch God and communicate with God. And how do you do that? So, Pastor, I'm not perfect. No, none of us are perfect, but we can keep our hearts clean and our spirits clean. And if we sin, we go and say, Jesus, I've, I've sinned. Please forgive me. And we keep that situation constant and current and fresh at all times. Sin had separated us from God. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, Christ made us nigh by his blood. We're going to give you several verses here. I'm hoping that you're, if you're not writing these down, uh, just the screen will have them. But at least if you have your scripture, you can turn there. Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. What is this called? This is reconciliation. So John 3, 1 through 8 is regeneration. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 through 2 and Ephesians 2, 13 is reconciliation. Isaiah 52 and 3 says, We had sold ourselves for naught or for nothing, and we were sold unto sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 14. We were sold unto sin. But 1 Peter 1, 18, 19, we were bought back by the blood of of Jesus. We call this redemption. So already there's regeneration, there's reconciliation, there's redemption. First, uh, John chapter 8 verses 39 through 44 tells us that our condition, our spiritual condition had categorized us as the children of the wicked one. Matter of fact, in John 8 44, Jesus said, "Ye are of your father the devil and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. But notice, Jesus told the Jews, he said, your daddy is the devil. Look at the first part of that verse. Ye are of your father, the devil. How is it that the Jews, Jesus said, your father is the devil? Because they were removed from God and living in sin, which means they were serving Satan. Jesus comes along and redeems them. I'm so glad we've been redeemed. Amen. Praise God. I'm so glad he made us his children. God's word calls this adoption. We went over adoption last week. How an adopted child in North Carolina has just as many rights as a biological child in North Carolina. What a powerful thing. That you can come out of a broken situation. I know of a, a, a couple kids from a very rural county in North Carolina brother and sister, very small. They were in a, a, a terrible situation. Parents were uh, uh, severe drug addicts, a lot of abuse in the home, no electricity during cold, several cold months, no food, no water. And an apostolic family here in North Carolina adopted those children, both of them at the same time, brought them into their home. Husband and wife, he makes really good money. They couldn't have children, big house. They adopted these two kids and they're raising them in the fear of God. Those children have zero rights under their prior parents because that relationship was severed. But now they have total rights under the new parents even though their blood is not flowing in their veins. They are adopted. And they have absolute inheritance rights. They have all rights as normal issue from the body of, of biological parents under North Carolina law. And when those, uh, when those parents die... In their will, they say, I give to my child, so and so. They don't even have to say, by the way, this child's adopted. Because the law sees zero distinction between adoption and biology. Isn't that great? Amen. Say, Pastor, what has that got to do on this Sunday morning? Here's what it has to do with it. You and I are not Jews. Right. We're Gentiles. And we weren't even part of the original plan. If you'd have been living under the Old Testament, 
you'd be out in the cold, friend, because we did not have access to the temple. We could not bring a sacrifice to Moses or Aaron or, or one of the high priests and say, uh, I told a lie this week. Would you kill this bullock and ask God to roll my sins? We didn't even have access to that. Amen. We were Jews. I mean, Gentiles. We weren't allowed into the courtyard of the tabernacle. But now in the, in the New Testament, Paul said, Ye who were once afar off are come nigh. And we can cry, Abba, Father, Romans chapter 8, which means God is now my Father. I'm thankful for that. Amen. Amen. I'm not celebrating the fact that the Jews did what they did to Jesus, but I'm kind of happy that, you know, Jesus said, You know what? If y'all don't want this, I'm going to give it to this group of people over here because I'm standing over in that crowd saying, Hey, I want it. If they don't want it, I want it. And now you and I can find the presence of God. We can feel the presence of God. And we should be thankful for that. And so we call that adoption. And so of the five doctrines of salvation, just brief review, we've dealt with regeneration. We've dealt with reconciliation. We've dealt with redemption. We've dealt with adoption. What is this idea of ransom, the doctrine of ransom? Here it is. Jesus Christ came... And paid every demand that our souls could be set free. Let's go to 1 Timothy 2.6. 1 Timothy 2.6. He gave himself a ransom for, everybody say all. all. Not just the Jews, but all, Jews and Gentiles, to be testified in due time. So we were taken captive. We were held by Satan, held against our will. Jesus Christ came and said, I'm going to pay the price and loose them from their bond. Loose them from their sin. And so as we kind of give this synopsis of these five subcategories of salvation, I just want to tell you, we've got a song to sing, folks. We've got a testimony to give. Call it redemption. Call it reconciliation. Call it regeneration. Call it adoption. Call it ransom. Any other biblical term, it really means salvation from sin. And we wouldn't be sitting here this morning if it wasn't for the grace of God and the mercy of God. So let me give you some facts about salvation. God's word from Genesis all the way to Revelation is filled with different facts about salvation, different facts. And we're teaching this because salvation is very nuanced. We think salvation is the current state that we're in right now. That's part of it. But friend, think about it. Really, not until those gates swing shut and we slap down on streets of gold and realize, whew, I'm here. Not until that happens are we really saved. And I don't want to put fear in you, but, and, and certainly don't want to induce anxiety, but you could backslide between now and then. You could live in sin when the trumpet sounds and not, not be caught up in the rapture. All of these things could happen. So really, I'm not going to say I'm absolutely saved until I get there. We certainly don't subscribe to the doctrine of once saved, always saved. That's a false doctrine. That's a man-made doctrine. Amen. People that teach that doctrine teach it, and they use the scripture, John 14, where Jesus said, no man can pluck you out of my hand. And that's true. No man can pluck you out of the hand of Jesus. But you can cause yourself to be lost, as I preached last Sunday. One of David's five giants that he fought in life was his own stinking flesh. Right? Right? And so, no, I can't cause Brother Jake to go to hell, but Brother Jake can cause Brother Jake to go to hell. And Brother Jake can't cause me to go to hell, but I can cause me to go to hell. See, I can't thwart his salvation, and he can't thwart mine, but I can screw it up on my own all by myself. And so we have to realize that the doctrine of once saved, always saved is a false doctrine. It's not true. It's, it's man-made. Judas backslid. Peter said, if you walk away from this salvation, it's like a sow that was washed, wallowing back in the mire, and a dog turning to its own vomit. Amen. It had been better for you not to have tasted of the things of God than to have tasted and gone back again. So we have to be careful that we don't sit here and say, well, I got the Holy Ghost, I got baptized in Jesus' name, got filled with the Spirit, and repented of my sins 37 years ago. I'm good. I'm good. Okay. You better stir that fire up. You better make sure you're praying. Amen. I mean, if you have a 37-year marriage and the first and only time you told your spouse you love him was the day you got married, you're probably in trouble. If you hadn't said it again 37 years, if you've never been intimate in 37 years, you've never held hands in 37 years, you might have problems. 
So let's don't import that into the work of God also and say, well, my, my walk with God is good because 48 years ago I was baptized. When was the last time you wept in the presence of God? When was the last time you felt His Spirit? When was the last time you spoke in tongues? When was the last time you found a place to pray and got under the power of the Holy Ghost and really just had a good praying through? Come on, somebody. Amen. Let's stir up our salvation. Stir up the gift that is within us. Amen. So here's some facts about salvation. Salvation is not just the present state of being. It's also eventually one day we want to hear the Lord say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. So there's initial salvation, there's continual current salvation, and then eternal salvation. And we'll get into all that in just a moment. But let's go through some facts about salvation. All right, here's rapid fire. Number one, salvation is in none other than Jesus Christ. That's it. This idea that all roads lead to, to heaven, that's, that's a man-made doctrine. Amen? That every church you pass by on the way to church is, is you know, that there's the Seventh-day Adventists and there's the Episcopalians and there's the Lutherans and there's the Pres Presbyterians, there's the Baptists, there's the Catholics. It really doesn't matter. We're all going the same place. False, wrong, not true. Okay? Try getting out on I-40 and saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to Canada, and all roads lead to Canada. Okay. You get on 40, and you go east, you're not going to Canada. You're going to hit Wilmington, and that's as far as you're going to get, unless you have a submarine and go out in the ocean and circle back around to the tip of Canada. You go west, you're going another place. It's not Canada. It's, it's just as communist as Canada, and that's California, but it's not, it's not Canada. That was a joke for those of you that know your politics, right? Trudeau and Gavin Newsom are pretty, pretty close in their political alignment. All roads don't lead to Canada. You got to get on something that's going north. You get on I-85 and you drive about 20 hours, you wind up in Canada. But it's, it's 40 is not going to take you there. You have to be pointed in your direction. You have to be intentional in where you're going. Come on, somebody. Amen. You say, well, I don't believe that. Okay, all right, listen. Those of you that don't believe that, practice what you preach. Tomorrow morning, get in your car and say, it doesn't matter which way I drive, I'll wind up at my job. Okay, do it tomorrow. How many are going to do that tomorrow? Because you don't believe that. You don't even believe your own doctrine. You know, if I don't get off at this exit, I'm not going to get to work on time. I got to turn here. I got to go this way. If there's a backup, Siri will take me around. I got to get to work on time. And there's only a couple ways to get there. So why do we say when it comes to our soul, all roads lead to heaven? That's so sloppy. It's a lie from Satan. We don't even practice that in the real world. If you get a lunch hour tomorrow and you want to go to uh, Burger King, get you a burger, or Bojangles, will get you some chicken tenders and, and you know, a, a bowberry biscuit. Woo, I just felt the spirit right there when I said that. And you got one hour to do it. You're not going to just go any, any way. Well, I'm just going to go up here toward Virginia and circle all the way around because all roads lead to Bojangles. You got one hour to get there, eat, and get back. So let's start practicing what we preach when it comes to our salvation. Here's what the Bible says, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice, name of Jesus Christ. Not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not any other way. There's one way to be baptized. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. One name that we must be baptized in. Not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One name. That doesn't sound to me like there's all roads leading to heaven. It sounds to me like straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And broad is the gate and wide that leads to destruction. Somebody say amen. amen. Fact number two about salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let's go to Romans 1.16. Gospel preaching and obedience to the gospel, produces salvation from sin. I am not ashamed, Paul said, of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. Look at this. The power of God unto what? Unto salvation. So it's the gospel of Christ 
is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Insert the word Gentile where it says Greek. So to the Jew first, and then to anybody that is a non-Jew. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. So it's the gospel that saves us. Okay, keep that in mind. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Verse 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. All right, here's the gospel. Are you ready? There's three components to it. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Everybody say the death. The death. Verse 4, he was buried. Everybody say the burial. And verse 4, he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Everybody say resurrection. So verses 3 and 4 encapsulate the three elements of the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the gospel, folks. And he said in verses 1 and 2, the gospel saves you. So all roads don't lead to heaven. Only the gospel road leads to heaven. When I was a kid growing up, we used to sing, I'm going to take a trip on that good old gospel ship, going far beyond the sky. I'm going to shout and sing. Some of y'all remember that old song. It's the gospel. The gospel saves you. The gospel gets you from point A to point B. Let's don't fall into heresy or false doctrine, believing that all roads lead to heaven. That's not true. Salvation is something Awesome. In our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, Paul said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Amen. Fact number three about salvation is it is a part of the armor of God, is the helmet of salvation. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. When Paul is telling the church in Ephesus about the armor of God, he said, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Without getting into all the different parts of the armor, it's important that you understand the armor protects specific parts of the body. Having your loins girt about with truth protects your reproductive ability. A church will not reproduce and have new converts if they're not preaching truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate protects the heart, protects the organs. If we don't have righteousness, we will not have the heart toward people that we need to have. We will not have the heart toward God that we need to have. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If we don't have peace, if we don't have the gospel, God's not going to order our path the way that it should. And the helmet of salvation, the helmet protects the brain. Salvation needs to protect the way that we think and the way that we process uh, our, our, anything that uh, has to do with our walk with God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 8. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8 also. We who are of the day, he said, be sober. Sober here does not mean lack of alcohol. Obviously, Christians don't drink alcohol at all, period. But sober here means serious. He says, be serious. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love, again, protecting the organs, and the helmet and hope for salvation. So here it is again, this idea of a helmet of salvation. Fact number four about salvation. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 3.15. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul writing to this young preacher, Timothy. Fact number four is this. God's word, the scripture, makes us wise unto salvation. He told Timothy, hey, Timothy, from a child, from a child, you have known the holy scriptures. His mother and his grandmother, Lois, taught him the scriptures. Amen. That shows you the power of being trained the proper way. Even if a a father's not in the picture, a mother can step in and train a child. A grandparent can help train a child. So here's this young preacher, this protege of the great apostle Paul. And Paul complimented him in verse number 15 and said, Hey, I know that you know the Holy Scriptures even from a child. And these are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So folks, we've got to get in the Word. You know what there's a famine of in our world today? Not a famine of bread, not a famine of water, but a famine of the preaching of the word. And there are, there's an entire generation, listen closely what I'm telling you, because I'm not saying this to be ugly 
and I'm not attacking anybody. I'm certainly not besmirching this younger generation. But there is a young generation coming up that don't even know basic Bible stories. And it's not because they have done anything wrong. It's because their parents never taught them. Their parents never exposed them. Their parents never said, you're going to Sunday school. They don't have a grandparent that was able to step in, not because they weren't willing, but maybe the parents didn't allow it to step in and say, hey, if you don't want to take him to Sunday school, let me take him. And so you have a generation coming up that when you talk about Noah and the ark, they're clueless. You talk about Adam and Eve in the garden, they're like, man, I've never heard that before. Joshua and the walls of Jericho. David and Goliath. I mean, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel and the lion's den. I'm talking about quintessential Bible stories that most apostolic people say, yeah, I've heard that a hundred times. There's a generation coming up that due to no fault of their own, they don't even know these things. Why? Because they weren't trained from a child with the Holy Scripture. Our job as a church is to minister to people at all levels. You may come to church and say, Pastor, my Lord, you're preaching that story again. I heard you preach that last year. I'm not preaching to you. I'm trying to reach somebody that doesn't know that story. My wife has cooked the same thing more than once in our marriage. But when she cooks it, I like it. I eat it again. I don't sit there and say, we had that three years and 31 weeks ago. I can't believe you're cooking it again. No. I look at that and I say, you know what? Last time I ate that, it was fantastic. I have no reason to believe it's not going to be fantastic right now. I'm going to eat this again. Right? Some of y'all go to the restaurant and order the same thing every time. But you come to church, if you hear one thing preached twice in a year, you say, oh my God, he's running out of stuff to preach. I promise you, I'll never run out of stuff to preach. I've been preaching 30-some years. I got plenty of messages, thousands of messages, and I'm very archived with them. I'm very detailed. I keep, I keep uh, dates and times and where I preach them. I know what I've preached, but sometimes I know there's somebody in the audience that they're, they're, you're, you're maybe up here, they're down here, simply because where they're beginning their journey with God. They're just new babes in Christ. So if pastor's preaching something you've heard recently, suck it up, buttercup. Act like you enjoy it. You'll get something good out of it. And just smile and say amen anyways. Because what you find to be deep and relevatory, that new person sitting there says, I don't even know what you're talking about. I've never even heard that. I don't even understand the story. Somebody say amen. We're all at a different level spiritually. Point number five. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. This is important. Titus 2, 11. It's the grace of God that brings salvation. It's the grace of God. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Remember, we are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. So what I'm teaching is this. I've been raised in Pentecost my whole life. My mom was baptized when she was nine months pregnant with me. I'm 52 and a half years old. I literally have been in church my entire life. Now... I wasn't always saved. I was a Pentecostal devil, if that makes sense. Until I got 14, until I got the Holy Ghost, got baptized. Okay? I know my Sunday school teachers probably saw me walk in and were like, oh, brother, I can't believe I got this kid in my class. Jesus, take the wheel. But thank God he filled me with the Holy Ghost. Got baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord for that. But I, I say that to say this. I'm not in church because of who my parents are or my pedigree, or the church that I was raised in, or, you know, any other connection to Pentecost. I'm in church, I'm saved because the grace of God. And all of us, for that matter, when you open your eyes today and you put your feet or swung your legs around the side of the bed and you stood up and stretched and yawned and whatever else you do when you get up, that's the grace of God. Not because we earned it. We're not here today because we're important and we earned it and we have a right to be here. We're here because God allowed us to be here. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Point number six about salvation. This is important. Let's go to 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. I love this verse. Our salvation is so great and spectacular. Even the Old Testament 
prophets inquired and searched diligently. <clears throat> and the angels desired to look into it. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. We are living in the dispensation that the Old Testament prophets prophesied about. Yeah. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and, and Habakkuk, and, and Joel. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit. And don't you know these men and women, when they were prophesying, they were thinking, man, I wish I could live during that time and see that happen. They foretold of this stuff happening, but they didn't get to experience it. And the angels in heaven saying, oh, wow, we don't have souls, the angels say. Jesus didn't die for us. He doesn't fill us with his spirit, the angels say. What would it be like for us to be able to be filled with the spirit of God and have a choice and have a soul? The angels desire to look into it. Amen. Don't take my word for it. Let's read the scripture. Verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. So, folks, we are living in a time that the Old Testament prophets wished they could live in. And we have experienced something that the angels wish they could experience. I remember the choir singing in my uh, original home church in Jacksonville, Florida. God gave me a song that the angels cannot sing. I've been washed in the blood by the crucified one. I've been redeemed. And we would sing that song. Thank God for salvation. And so we have something that is precious. Why would we not take care of it? Why would we just treat it like it's not important? Point number seven about salvation. I'm moving quickly. While this salvation is called great, the Greek word is vast and mighty, it is also, look at this, called common. Jude chapter 1 verse 3. What does it mean by common? Does that mean it's denigrated? Does that mean it's less than valuable? Does that mean that it's just, oh, well, it's not important? No, no, no. The word common here in the Greek means shared by all. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, put that up on the screen, says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? So the Lord tells us it's a great salvation. But Jude chapter 1, verse 3, let's go back there, calls it a common salvation. Meaning everybody is able to access it. Amen. Not just the rich, not just the Jews, not just the, the important people, not just people in a certain zip code, not just people who wear a certain lapel in, inside their jacket, not just people who drive a certain car or, or, or have a certain size house. Everybody can access this salvation. Amen. It's common salvation, which was delivered unto the saints. Praise God. I'm thankful we have the opportunity to enjoy this salvation. Amen. I could go on and on and on. There's other facts about salvation that you would need to study and could be added in your notes. But the Old Testament facts and references to those found in the New Testament are, are, are cooperative here. Now, let me give you three stages of salvation. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. We had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. What is Paul talking about? If a saint of God dies in Christ, we trust God that the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is going to rise us from the dead. Amen. We trust God, right? Verse 11, ye also helping together by prayer for us that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Now, in this particular passage of scripture, Paul makes reference to God delivering him from what appears to be 
a brush with death. And he also acknowledges that one day when we die, Jesus Christ is going to raise us. Notice he used all three tenses. He used the past, the present, and the future to describe how God saved him from death. The past, the present, and the future. That's important. Our confrontation this morning is not with physical death, but with spiritual death. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, Paul declares how we were dead in trespasses and sin, but God quickened and made us alive. Notice here, and you hath he quickened, that word means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to uh, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ by grace ye are saved. Notice the word quicken here means alive. Verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Paul declares in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 6. We were dead in sins. We were dead in our trespasses. But God scooped down and picked us up and gave us life. In Paul's personal deliverance from death we find this beautiful analogy of the three stages of salvation. All three tenses, past, present, and future, in his description are applicable to our salvation from sin. And so there are three stages of salvation. I'm going to start with the first and we'll finish up with the other two next week. And I hope, I hope some of you all are getting this. I, from my standpoint, where I'm looking out on some of you, some of you are very tired this morning. I hope during the break you can get you some fresh water and some air and and kind of snap out of it a little bit. I understand we're all weary. I understand we've worked hard. But I hope I'm not talking way over your head today. Okay, I hope that you're understanding this. This is important. What am I trying to say? You cannot just take advantage of this great salvation God has given us and act like, oh well, it'll always be there. It's a privilege to be saved. It's a privilege that out of the 8 billion with a B people on this planet, you and I are able to sit in the presence of God. And I don't ever want to take that for granted. I don't want to just get up and take it for granted that, you know, well, I've always been able to breathe every day. I'm going to breathe again today. And the sun has been rising every day since I've been alive. It's going to rise again today. And it's going to set just like it's always set. It's going to set today. There's always a summer and there's always a fall and there's always a winter and there's always a spring. And that's just going to continue. We take stuff for granted all the time. We go over and flip a light switch. Well, lights are going to come on. That's what they always do. We turn a faucet. Water's going to come out. That's what it always does. Let's don't take for granted the salvation we have. Because it's a privilege to get out of bed and know that I am one of the few that have not only been exposed to truth, but I've obeyed truth and I'm able to enjoy something the prophets used to say, man, we wish we could experience that. I'm able to enjoy something the angels say, man, I wish I could get down there and get filled with the Holy Ghost. But I get to, and you get to. What a privilege that is. And so three stages of salvation. The first stage is initial salvation. We'll talk about that briefly. I will not finish that. The second stage is continual salvation. And the third stage is eternal salvation. So what is initial salvation? Well, initial salvation refers to the experience of the new birth, which Jesus taught us as an essential experience if we're going to enter the kingdom of God. How many of you can remember the morning or the night, whatever the service was, when you first got the Holy Ghost? Raise your hand. All right, put your hands down. How many of you can remember the morning or the night when you got baptized in Jesus' name? That's initial salvation. Okay? It's initial beginning stages of salvation. Doesn't mean you're saved at that point but you're in a saved condition, initial salvation. 
So in order to obtain salvation or deliverance from such a hopeless state, God's word outlines in simple, understandable terms what we have to do. What is the first step of salvation? Let's go to Hebrews 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Verse 3, through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Skip down to verse number 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Everybody say impossible. That means it ain't going to happen. Impossible means impossible. Impossible means there's zero chance to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is. That he is what? That he is. That he exists. In other words, an atheist has got to stop saying, I don't believe there's a God, and he's got to start saying, I believe he exists. You cannot have faith in a deity that you don't even believe exists. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then starting in verse number 7, Paul takes great detail in dealing with different patriarchs and matriarchs all throughout the, uh, chapter 11, and we call that the Faith Hall of Fame. Okay, Noah, he then later on talks about Joseph, he talks about uh, uh, Abraham, look for a city whose builder and maker was God. He names a litany of people that lived in faith. And so when we talk about faith, we have to understand that we have to believe God's word is... And that he rewards people who diligently seek him. You've got to believe the word. You've got to believe the Bible. You have to have a willingness and readiness to obey it. If you're watching online this morning or you're sitting here presently and you say, Pastor, I don't even know where to start. Let me help you. Let me help you. Don't try to figure everything out. I don't understand baptism. That's okay. I don't understand the Holy Ghost. That's okay. Let's start baby steps. Let's start with you just saying, I believe in God. Now, that's not total salvation, but that's the first step. Let's just take baby steps. How about push everything else out and say, when I consider the works of thy hands, the moon and the stars, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou would visit him? When I look at the geese flying in a V formation and the trout swimming upstream and the beautiful colors in the North Carolina mountainside and when I look at the, the, the babbling brook and I look at the birds singing and the green grass, I must realize God exists. I believe in God. Now, now that I believe in God, take that step and move to the next step. What is the next step? Repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9, 10, and 11. Repentance is an act. It's following faith. You have to have faith first, then repentance. And repentance causes us to seek God's forgiveness from past and present sins. True repentance induces Godly sorrow. Okay? So, let me read in great detail, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9. We're going to close with this. I'm going to leave this with you as you're leaving. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse number 9. Now I rejoice, Paul said, not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now, do you see what Paul is saying? The world has this brand of sorrow that will lead you down the path to death. God also has a brand of sorrow that if you allow him to work on your heart, he will lead you to repentance. So once you have faith in God, then you're sitting in a service much like this. The Spirit of God begins to work on you. And the preacher's preaching and the singers are singing and the word is going out. And the Spirit of God is rippling out through that audience. And I've seen people just begin to weep. And they'll say, I don't even know why I'm crying. I know why. That's godly sorrow. And it's working repentance. How many know what I'm talking about? 
How many times have we seen guests come in and, and, and they enjoy the service, they're feeling the presence of God, and, and they say, man, I believe, I, I know God's real, and all of a sudden, God begins to get a hold of their heart. And before you know it, they're in an altar with their hands lifted, praying. Amen. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. And it's not the kind of sorrow that the world talks about. True repentance produces this godly sorrow. And true repentance is a changing of direction and a changing of mind. True repentance is not, Lord, I'm sorry for drinking. I'm sorry for getting drunk. I'm sorry for, for you know, blah, blah, blah. True repentance is saying all that and then going home, opening the refrigerator, pulling out the six-pack, and pouring it down the toilet. Flush. Pouring it down the toilet. Flush. Pouring it down the toilet. And then saying, okay, when I go to food line next week, I'm not even going down that aisle. Boy, I just stepped in something right there. I felt it. True repentance is, I'm sorry, and I'm going to do what I have to do to not do it again. That's true repentance. True repentance is going home and getting that bag out in the sock drawer that's got the leafy substance in it, you know, shaking it out in the toilet and saying, bye-bye. And I'm not going to go buy that anymore from the dealer because I don't want that in my life. That's true repentance. And I'm not talking about oregano either. (laughs) True repentance. Somebody say amen. amen. And then next week we'll pick up with the third step, which is baptism. All right, so we're talking about so great salvation. I hope you're learning something here this morning. Praise God. Let's stand together. Thank God for his presence today. We're going to have a great service today, folks. God's power is here. God's spirit is here. If you're sick in your body, God can heal you. If you need the Holy Ghost, you can get the Holy Ghost today. If you've never been baptized, we can take care of that before the day is over. Let's ask God to help us right now. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together in our adult Sunday school class. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ who have made it a point to be faithful to the house of God this morning. We're looking forward to a great service today, looking forward to being in your presence, God. We ask you to open our minds and our hearts to the teaching and preaching of your powerful word. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said amen. 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 God bless you. Let's take our break. Use the restroom. Get something to drink. We'll start service right at 11 o'clock.